Professor Ishii noted, we are about a week and a half away from the 40th anniversary of the Taiwan Relations Act. And it was an act born in a moment of crisis, certainly a crisis for Taiwan and a crisis for U.S.-Taiwan relations. It came in the immediate aftermath of the normalization of diplomatic relations between the People's Republic of China and the United States, which entailed, in effect, a severing, a derecognition, a formal severing of uh, diplomatic relations with the Republic of China on Taiwan, and also the termination of the Mutual Defense Treaty that had been in place since 1954. Uh, there was, as uh, some of you who are uh, of advanced age, like I was on the panel here, I will remember that there was some uh, controversy in Congress about this. Uh, that, plus uh, some forces in the administration, led to the adoption of the Taiwan Relations Act, but it was, again, a contentious moment. We even had one of those rare cases where members of Congress sued uh, the president, that doesn't happen all that often, although we may be seeing more of it soon. Uh, but uh, basically, Goldwater v. Carter, the case that challenged uh, the president's authority to terminate uh, the defense treaty. So a moment of, of high tumult, of high crisis. And here we are 40 years later, living with the Taiwan Relations Act that has been a foundational element of the U.S.-Taiwan relationship, a fundamental element of U.S. policy toward cross-straits relations. Uh, and the region, um, and that has uh, stood as a central document with very little change over 40 years. Um, so we're going to talk a lot about where we are now and where we think we're going to go or could go from here, but first I think it's important to fill in a little more of the background. Uh, and so for someone who has observed this longer than any of us, let me uh, pass it over to Jerry Cohen to tell us how we got to the, uh, to the Taiwan Relations Act. Uh, don't worry, I am not going to give you a commercial for the NYU <laughs> except to say that we've been studying Taiwan mainland relations and related U.S. problems for a long time. I'm delighted to share a panel with people who know a lot more about Taiwan than I do, but I am continuingly interested in the subject. Now, this subject has a background. It didn't begin in 1978-79. We are concerned today with the defense of Taiwan. I think all of us here love Taiwan. The problem is President Trump claims to be in love with Xi Jinping. <laughs> and, pardon? And Kim Jong-un. Yes, of course. I don't want to complicate things by bringing in North Korea. But we don't know what he's going to do or how long he'll be around. But whatever new administration might turn out to be, we have to deal with the past because the past is the future. And by that I mean we're talking about the ability and the wisdom of defending Taiwan. In 1950, January, after a year and a half or more of nationwide debate in this country, highly partisan Republican Democrat bitter discussions. President Truman on January 5th, 1950, and Dean Acheson, Secretary of State on January 12th, announced that the United States would not defend Taiwan. Taiwan was part of China. It had been returned to China in accordance with the commitments when the Chiang Kai-shek forces were permitted to occupy Taiwan in October 45. Mr. Atchison, a great lawyer, and later my boss in the law firm, he announced that nobody raised any lawyer's doubts when Chiang Kai-shek was put in control of Taiwan. That was in accordance with the international wartime commitments, he said. Six months later, June 26, 1950, when North Korea invaded South Korea, the United States did a 180-degree turn. We took another look at the situation, and President Truman, Secretary Atchison, and others said, the status of Taiwan is really undetermined and would we'll have to await the restoration of security in the Pacific for a vote referendum of people on Taiwan or something. And in the inter interim, we would place our fleet in the Taiwan Strait and defend the Chiang Kai-shek forces and the people on Taiwan from a communist takeover. Now, the legal 
real situation formally never was uh, established to further that position, the original January 50 position that Taiwan was returned to China. Uh, John Foster Dulles, uh, Eisenhower's uh, uh, Secretary of State, uh, was a very good lawyer also, and he made sure that the peace treaties renounced Japan's claim to Taiwan and the related islands, but did not say to whom. So the formal legal position has never been clarified. Now that was the United States position. Uh, we had, Jacques said, a defense treaty beginning 54 to formalize our commitment to defend Taiwan. But the problem was the world changed and over time it made sense for the United States to establish diplomatic relations with the People's Republic, which we did on January 1, 1979. The question was, however, what did this mean for Taiwan? Now in getting to normalization with Beijing, we had the famous Nixon trip of February 21st and 28th, 1979. 72 that had been arranged on uh, Henry Kissinger's secret trip of July 71. And that produced the famous Shanghai communique. And the Shanghai communique had to meet this problem. In order to move ahead with Beijing, what were we going to say about Taiwan? Beijing was insisting that we say Taiwan was part of China the original Truman Atchison position. And of course, the United States didn't want to say that. But the United States wanted to get on with relations to Beijing. And so the Shanghai communique had this perfectly ambiguous two-sentence declaration on the subject. And the first sentence said that the United States recognized that all Chinese on either side of the strait said that claim that Taiwan was part of China, all Chinese on either side of the strait. The next sentence, however, went on to say, the United States does not challenge that position. Well, what does that mean? Uh, I hear you saying the sun is shining today. And I say, I don't challenge that position. Does that mean I agree with it? I endorse it, I ignore it. When Marshall Green, our then Assistant Secretary of State for East Asia, returned from China and went before the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, he was a very clever man and he could keep a very straight face. He said, the US position toward Taiwan has not changed. Well, obviously it had changed. But how it had changed, we still don't know because the normalization didn't deal with this. But we should remember, although Taiwan is not the same Taiwan it was under when it was under Chiang Kai-shek's Leninist dictatorship, Taiwan people now have made this huge progress that we're all celebrating. Beijing has a long memory. And from Beijing's point of view, the US was cynically manipulating its international commitments one day advocating the territorial integrity of, tai of Taiwan and China being together, and then the next day saying the status of Taiwan is undetermined. This raises two grave questions here. One is, what is the legal status of Taiwan and how will that be decided? But second question is, does Beijing have the right to use force in the order to resolve the situation if it can't do so voluntarily. My own interpretation of contemporary international law is that no country now has the right to use force to settle a territorial dispute. But Beijing says the Americans during the Civil War, 1860s, President Lincoln, they used war to keep the country together and prevent secession by the South. But of course, this isn't the 1860s. Taiwan isn't the Taiwan of the Chiang Kai-shek era. And the world has to consider, what does this mean? What shall we do? And that's
that's why we're here to mark the significance of the Taiwan relations. And as we'll get into, one of the uh, important pieces of content of the uh, Taiwan Relations Act is the U.S. commitment to the avoidance of coercive measures uh, to resolve the outcome. And of course, Beijing's move on the international law front is, is to try, try to characterize this as an internal matter where uh, they say you can use force. One Jiao was actually quite fond of quoting Lincoln uh, in the Civil War. Uh, so before we turn to, to the content of the law itself and its impact, does anyone else want to weigh in on the prehistory of uh, the Taiwan Relations Act? Um, I would like to sell a PhD thesis. I would like to sell a PhD thesis to uh, anybody with, with interested students. I happen to have been in Washington uh, at the time the Taiwan Relations Act was being debated. And I had higher level security clearances than the guy at the State Department who was in charge of it. And, and uh, he would call me frequently and exchange thing, uh, views on the gray phone about just what the State Department thought they could get away with with regard to Taiwan, uh, I mean Congress, on, on this act they were drawing up. And I only know his little piece of the jigsaw puzzle, but there's obviously a much larger one and Barry Goldwater talking about uh, the, the, his horror that this was supposed to be, that the TRA was supposed to provide a decent interval before China absorbed Taiwan. And uh, so there's a fascinating story to be told, and it obviously has a large bearing on the Taiwan Relations Act and ultimately on the future of Taiwan. And 40 years is a big decent interval so far. Uh, I just one quick point uh, to this, and Jerry has forgotten more about the U.S.-Taiwan relationship than I will ever know, and so I will never, uh, you know, challenge him on the history of this. But I would just add a, a point to this: is that is that the this ambiguous approach that um, Jerry has mentioned um, was driven out of necessity. Uh, it was driven out of the the context of the you know Cold War and the flexibility that was required in order to. Uh, you know, compete with the Soviet uh, Union, uh, while at the same time being able to maintain a flexible approach to maintaining stability in the Taiwan Strait. And just as how the world changed to create that necessity, uh, as Jerome, as Jerry has also uh, recognized, is that the world is changing now as we speak too. And so I think this is something that we need to take stock of as we assess the 40 years of this enduring partnership and where do we go from here. Okay, so we're, uh, we're going to spend much of our time up here talking about how we evaluate uh, what the Taiwan Relations Act has wrought over 40 years and where we might go from here, but um, I think I'll just say a few words to, to frame this about what the Taiwan Relations Act, in fact, says, not in too much detail, because it's a rather long document, uh, and a little bit about where it fits into the, the broader landscape of U.S. policy and, and commitments on this front. Um, so, of course, it declares some U.S. policies that have been fairly fundamental to the relationship. It declares U.S. opposition to a coerced solution, uh, China mainland or Chinese coerced solution to the Taiwan uh, issue. Um, it makes a broad commitment to Taiwan's ability to defend itself and U.S. support for that, partly through arms sales. Uh, and it does a lot of uh, what I think you can call as if uh, arrangements. Uh, that is, it, uh, it, although Taiwan, prior to the Taiwan Relations Act, of course, lost formal diplomatic recognition, lost uh, the kinds of relationships that went with that. What it does essentially say is a matter of U.S. law, Taiwan gets treated pretty much as if it were a state in the international system, and its government, the ROC, gets treated as if it were a government. So it can have uh, the equivalent of embassies, the equivalent of consulates, can have sovereign immunity, all these kinds of things. Uh, that's important symbolically, of course. It gives Taiwan some degree of status that it was otherwise at risk of losing, even if it has lost something. Um, and it's important functionally, it just for the mechanics of continuing to to maintain relations, including membership in international agreements, and so on. So it does a lot on those fronts, uh, symbolically and practically. In some ways, it requires very little. It doesn't actually require particular levels of arms sales. It doesn't particularly dictate the details of, or the level of the relationship. Presidents have a lot of discretion on that, and it's varied some over time. Um, but it, it is, I think, among the so-called sacred texts, as it were, of, of, uh, of US policy toward Taiwan and cross-rates issues, which include the three communiques, by some accounts might include the six assurances, and the Taiwan Relations Act. Uh, the Taiwan Relations Act is, at least compared to the three communiques, um, the most pro-Taiwan of the documents. I mean, it actually makes commitments 
uh, to support uh, for Taiwan. Um, and it is the most deeply entrenched. It is part of US law adopted by Congress. Presidents are bound by it. And in the US view, although not in China's view, uh, the communiques are not treaties. They are policy statements of, of a great deal of endurance, but they don't have the status of law uh, in the US system. Um, and they don't have Congress uh, standing up saying this is something we did and it is part of US law. One other last thing I'll mention about content is a provision that was put in the TRA that was hardly friendly to the ROC at the time. It was the one about the US interest in the human rights of the people in Taiwan. As Taiwan was democratized and uh, accomplished a great deal on the human rights front and you now a full-fledged, vibrant democracy, that is actually a provision now that echoes the value strain, as it were, in US foreign relations. And that's, I think, been a part of the TRA that's become a significant, more significant pro-Taiwan element over the year. So I, I uh, welcome my colleagues to weigh in further on that. Um, but I'll bundle that in uh, with the question of whether the TRA has worked so far uh, for the US, for Taiwan, uh, for peace and stability, for whatever your metric of uh, success is. Um, so I'm sure everyone's going to weigh in on this. I'll start with Shelley. OK, thank you. Um, thanks for having me here. This is a really wonderful event, and I'm very delighted to be able to sit in such excellent company. I think the Taiwan Relations Act has definitely worked as a stabilizer and as a frame within which U.S.-Taiwan relations could develop for many decades beyond when that decent interval was expected to close, right? Um, so, and I think part of the reason that the TRA has been so successful and part of the reason U.S.-Taiwan relations have been durable over this span of time is that as the U.S. and as the international environment changed, Taiwan also changed in a way that uh, made the Taiwan Relations Act of enduring relevance across a, a pretty significant evolutionary span in world history. And you can see the, the seeds of its evolutionary potential in the TRA itself. So as Jacques pointed out, the TRA mentions human rights as a factor that is of, of, of importance to the United States. But what I've been thinking of in particular is that when in, 19, in the early 1970s in particular, when uh, the normalization process between the US and the PRC began, and continuing really into the late 70s when it completed, a really strong motivator for many Americans was anti-communism. And so there were plenty of people who supported the TRA in Congress because they were unhappy about the fact that the US was potentially turning its back on a non-communist and in fact an anti-communist ally in order to forge a relationship with a communist country. So you could imagine that if the US had become less preoccupied with communism, if the PRC had become less communist, if Taiwan had become less of a kind of anti-communist bulwark, that any of those things could have kind of unwound the, the fundamental logic of the TRA. But instead, what happened was the US became, especially after the fall of the Soviet Union in the late 1980s, the US became much less motivated by anti-communism. The PRC became much less of a sort of stereotypical uh, communist state. And Taiwan became much less concerned about upholding its anti-communist uh, reputation and more concerned to um, portray itself and to actually be, in fact, a democracy and, and that its own democratic evolution became the source of its virtue in the international system. But because all of those things happened together, there was a sort of transfer of Taiwan's value to the US from anti-communism to its democratic transformation so that even after the fall of communism and even after many American politicians were less motivated by that kind of thinking, Taiwan still had a place in the sort of the national heart 
of the United States, there was still a reason for the US to support and continue to persist in carrying out the TRA. And I think that it, it's a kind of, it, it need not have happened in that way, but the, the way the world changed and Taiwan's ability to keep up with the changing external environment has, I think, contributed to the longevity of the TRA. I think Jerry wants to play on this point, then I'll move to uh, Russell. I want to build on what Shelley has just said, because the world is further changing. And one important change is the United States is returning to anti-communism. The fascination that has preoccupied us with the blue ads in Beijing since the early 70s opened up China era that many of us have lived through in China and elsewhere, is now yielding, and Xi Jinping is helping to make that change by his really revolting repression, much worse than the preceding regime of Hu Jintao. He is playing into this change and helping to accelerate an anti-mainland China attitude at the same time, we have seen further democratic changes in Taiwan. We're going to see another free election uh, next year. And this human rights development, this rule of law development, this democratic uh, development that shows that people of Chinese ethnic origin are fully capable of maintaining a democratic system. That's become more and more important. But there's another element we can't ignore, and it's been there from the beginning. Taiwan, strategically, is very important. The old cliche about it is the unsinkable aircraft carrier. There are many people in Washington, frankly, who underestimate the importance of human rights and who would not be willing to go to the defense of Taiwan if they had to, except for the strategic argument. So it's like Chairman Mao admonished us to walk on two legs. We have to appreciate Taiwan's strategic importance, especially as Beijing expands its naval power, et cetera. But we also have to see the importance of the profound gap that has developed and is continuing to develop uh, between Just to underscore uh, Jerry's point about the return to a, a bit of a Cold War vibe, of course, but, you know, two documents that I think pointed out quite nicely as you look at Xi Jinping's 19th Party Congress speech, which is you know, very heavily laden with ideology and, and a lot of old style language, as well as the behavior Jerry points to. And of course, the US national security strategy, which essentially identifies China as a, a rival uh, in, in, in no uncertain terms. Uh, but on this issue of, of how the TRA has done, whether it's worked in its first uh, 40 years. Let me uh, ask our other two panelists to weigh in. I'll start with Russell and Benji. Sure. No. <clears throat> Thanks. I think given the premise of our talk today being that it's enduring framework, we sort of all have a, an agreement that it has worked to at least a certain extent. Uh, but I think the core question that we're also getting at is, you know, if it isn't broken, then why do we need to fix it? And I think the reason why, and I think there are three key points, I, I think, why we need to fix it um, is that is that we need to, A, we need to recalibrate the policy, and secondly, is that while we're heading in the right direction, I think we need to start thinking about a destination. And I think the third is that we need to shift from a more reactive to a more proactive policy. And, and really, I think the first step is that, the first issue is, why do we need to recalibrate? Is that, I think, while the United States and Taiwan has maintained a policy of trying to maintain the status quo, and this has helped to maintain peace in the Taiwan Strait, and this is, I think, you know, in, in at least in the best near-term option, China is unceasingly pushing uh, to destabilize uh, uh, the Taiwan Strait and unilaterally changing the status quo. So I think where there are two parties here trying to maintain the status quo while you know China is pushing to change it, you know, that's just not a very sustainable type of uh, relationship unless there's a proportionate uh, pushback to the type of coercive activities that China is engaged in. Uh, in addition to that, I think while the United States has been effective in trying to deter Beijing from taking destructive actions while China has been relatively weaker, 
China is, uh, its military capabilities are growing, and I think that this, their, the risk of this approach is actually increasing without greater clarity of uh, U.S. Uh, commitments to defend Taiwan because this could embolden Beijing to take military action in the event uh, that it feels it, it is necessary in its interest to do so. Uh, and so I think that you know, this type of um, maintenance of the status quo that is, the, I think, the crust of uh, the approach of dealing with the PRA uh, may, be, um, may be increasingly coming under strain. But at the same time, I think there's a great deal of elasticity in terms of the U.S. approach to, uh, to Taiwan. And I think the broader sort of contours of our, uh, of our discussion today will really sort of highlight where those, how those parameters are uh, expanding. Uh, Russell's remarks put me in mind of the what should be a yoga berry, ber yogi berryism about Taiwan relations, which is we love the status quo. The problem is the status quo keeps changing. Uh, Jim, you were... Well, I actually wanted to uh, offer an aphorism of my own on that, and that is that the status quo only works when there's stasis, and you're not having stasis. And uh, now, to be fair, both sides have tried to change the status quo. Um, uh, I, I, I have a, um, some hesitation because on the one hand, I agree with you that we have been too reactive. On the other hand, I'm not going to say proactive, I don't like that word, but, but everybody else does but me. Uh, active. Uh, the problem with being active is that we don't want to get out in front on this one. And uh, we Beijing is constantly looking for a provocation or something it can call a provocation so that it can say that we are forced to take this action. Uh, so this is something you see frequently. Uh, and uh, certainly you saw it when Obama, uh, or if you prefer, since it was uh, Hillary Clinton's article in Foreign Affairs that preceded it, the uh, pivot to Asia. China says, oops, the United States is threatening us. We've got to reinforce some of these islands and create some new ones out of coral reefs because you've provoked us. And we don't want to get into that. And, uh, and if we are too active, it puts Taiwan in a bad position because the United States is unlikely to attack, I mean, China is unlikely to attack the United States but Taiwan will use this, quote, provocation, unquote, to make life more difficult for Taiwan. So you will find ships straying across the uh, median line uh, in, in the strait. You will find more overflights of Taiwan territory. You will find more Taiwanese businessmen arresting on spying charges and things like that. So uh, I... I usually worry about myself being the rash person in any discussion, but, but here I would just caution that we have to calibrate this really carefully. And to pile on what Jerry said, I think uh, it was possible to assume in the early 1980s, early 1980s, that there would be convergence across the Taiwan Strait. Taiwan was becoming more democratic, and it looked like China was becoming more democratic. And instead, uh, what you have happening under Xi Jinping is divergence. Taiwan becomes more democratic, and meanwhile, China becomes much more autocratic. And you know, the buzzword for, for Trump is not actually communism, it's socialism. And it's so useful to bring out Chavez and Venezuela on that one, but it works nicely. And the US Democratic Party. Uh, so, so we've covered some of the, uh, the storm clouds ahead or some of the uh, inherent risks or, or weaknesses that have been there, uh, perhaps from the beginning of the Taiwan Relations Act. I do want to turn shortly to that question of, sort of where, do we, where do we see the current threats to uh, the relationship that's endured for 40 years. I had done to do a somewhat contrarian thing here, contrary to some of the prior comments, and contrary to my own usually alarmist and pessimistic nature. Uh, but it's put in a pitch for how well it has worked, just to remind ourselves of, of the 40 years that really have been uh, remarkably um, successful. I mean, yes, born in crisis, and yes, the Taiwan Relations Act and the, the broader relationship that's partly anchored by it 
uh, have seen its share of, of troubles, uh, but who in 1949 would have expected that Taiwan would have survived and thrived and have the kind of stature and status and autonomy that it does now, the kind of relationship with the United States? Uh, it would have been hard to, uh, hard to predict. I would have been very optimistic. And you know, we've made it through some rough patches. If you think of things like the 1995-96 missile crisis, the Chinese reaction to Li Dunhui's speech at his visit to Cornell, you think of the response to the 1999 uh, statement by President Lee about one country each side, you know, Yang Wulun, as, as Beijing called it, uh, the, the conflict over, during the Chen Shui-bian years when, when uh, George W. Bush had his fireside chat with Wen Jiabao, uh, kind of slapping down Chen Shui-bian for threatening the status quo, the U.S. reaction to the 2008 uh, uh, UN uh, membership under the name of Taiwan referendum, uh, and now the very cold shoulder uh, that Beijing has shown to the Tsai Ing-wen administration, the renewed poaching of diplomatic allies, one could go on and on. A lot of crises there, but the U.S. has, by and large, navigated that in a way that has maintained not unequivocal or unconditional support for Taiwan, but really quite robust uh, support where all sides have been able to uh, expect a certain degree of continuity. And I think the TRA, more than anything else in the repertoire of U.S. positions on Taiwan and cross-strait policies, has been the, the lone star or the safe harbor uh, that U.S. officials scurry back to if they do things that threaten to upset the relationship. Uh, so you get things like um, when Clinton took a lot of flack for the Li Dunhui invitation or for the three no's, which were seen as kind of going first too much toward Taiwan and then too much toward the mainland. The ritual statement comes out, our policy has not changed. It's something which Jerry reminds us goes all the way back to 1950, even though, of course, it does change. Or you think of George W. Bush saying we would do whatever it took to help Taiwan defend itself. And on the other hand, Secretary of State Powell going out and saying Taiwan has no sovereignty. Again, deviating too far, you kind of scurry back to the shelter of the unchanged policy anchored in the TRA. And of course, as with all things Trump, it's been even more volatile in recent years uh, than we've seen uh, in the years before. It's so been everything from the phone call and the casting of doubt on the One China policy to uh, swinging the other side of the pendulum, uh, the promise to consult with Xi Jinping before a second phone call. Here again, we have people going out and saying, our policy is unchanged, it remains anchored by the Taiwan Relations Act. So it's this thing which has really kind of uh, allowed us to steer between the silly and the grimness of being, uh, being uh, destabilizing. So you know, many flaws there, but just, just worth uh, recalling uh, the areas where it's worth, and I see Gary wants to weigh in on this. There are a couple of things worth commenting about with respect to international law. Of course, Beijing maintains international law has got nothing to do with this question. It's a purely domestic question and everyone else must keep out. Of course, that's nonsense. Uh, it's not a purely uh, domestic question. It involves profound questions of international relations and national security. And even if you look at the legal situation, we have, ever since the normalization of relations, 70, 40 years ago, we have continued to sell arms to Taiwan. Now, how do you justify that? If the U.S. had formally acknowledged that Taiwan is part of China, as Beijing interprets the Shanghai communique, we couldn't possibly be doing that internationally. How do you sell arms to a dissident part of a country if you recognize that that part of the country is really integrated with the central government. It's not justifiable. The Taiwan Relations Act is a unilateral act of Congress, but it's based on certain international assumptions, and that's very important. Now, Beijing says, of course, it is inconsistent with the arrangements we made with them. They say the Shanghai Communique was a binding international agreement. We would say it was a mutual declaration of intention that didn't have any formal legal status. So this is the kind of argument you hear. Now, I want to emphasize cross strait relations. Xi Jinping leadership will not endure. We don't know how much longer he will be in this almost total dictatorial control of the country. I remember writing in the book in 1968, at the height of the Cultural Revolution, that this too would pass. This is not.
not going to last, I said. And of course it didn't. The Chinese people couldn't stand for it. And you see, the Chinese people will not stand for the continuing expanding abuses of the Xi Jinping government. There is among the elite, although he's still very popular with the masses, there is among the elite increasing dissatisfaction, although most people are too intimidated, understandably, to speak out. But the Chinese people are better than what they're getting now. And we have to be ready, and we have to keep the peace in the Taiwan Strait and keep Taiwan factually independent and strong enough to continue to wait out this game. Now, the Ma Yingzhou regime demonstrated something. Chinese leadership in Beijing is very practical. They can be ideological, they can be threatening, but they're very pragmatic people. For decades, they used to maintain, we, the Beijing Communist leadership, will never negotiate with Taiwan, a mere province of China. How could we, the central government, treat them like an equal? But what happened under Mai Yingzhou? You had over 20 negotiated cross strait on an equal basis between Taiwan and the mainland, despite what Beijing's theoretical position, ideological position was. And that was done because both sides adopted some fictions. And Chinese are very able to use fictions if they have some practical end. I always quote what the scholar Holmes Welch said while he was working at Harvard decades ago, he called uh, in the Atlantic magazine, he had an article called The Chinese Art of Make-Believe. And it showed the attempt at successful use of fictions in order to achieve practical ends. And that's what Beijing did with Ma Yingzhou with over 20 agreements. This era can return. And the question is, what policies, what language has to be mobilized in the interim while we're waiting for a shift to a much more moderate leadership in Beijing? Life is so contingent. The Chinese Communist Party leadership could have gone in a very different direction, as we've already heard. It might have gone to Hu Yaobang. It might have gone to Zhao Ziyang. Zhu Rongji was a terrifically practical, enlightened person. Domestic contingencies led to their ouster. But there will be a day, and I don't think it's going to be too long, even though I may not live to see it, when there will be a more moderate leadership in China. And world conditions, if we can hold the line now, will favor, again, the resurrection of the kind of cooperation across straits that we have seen. So as Ferris pointed out, um, the current state on the mainland is not necessarily conducive uh, to um, positive cross strait relations, and that may be a China side threat uh, to what we've seen uh, wrought by the TRA and other undertakings. So let, let me just ask the rest of the panel to weigh in on, on where you think the challenges are, where are the risks to what has been, for all of its troubles, a relatively stable and, and sustainable arrangement. Shall we be on it? Well, in my previous comment, I said that uh, the TRA was very well suited to the late Cold War era, and it was also very well suited to the post-Cold War era. But uh, both uh, Jerry Cohen and June Dreyer have pointed out that we are maybe no longer in the post-Cold War era. We are in some new era which it's probably a terrible label, post-Cold post War era. But whatever it is, uh, I have some concern about whether the TRA is as well suited to this era as to the previous two. Because there are, uh, mainly because of changes in the US, that's my primary concern, although I think also changes in China and the international environment are, are definitely uh, making life more difficult for Taiwan and, and for Taiwan's 
leaders. But um, two features of the, uh, the current US administration and its outlook on international relations, I think, are especially troubling when it comes to the TRA. And the first of those is the declining interest in defending democracy around the world or uh, calling upon democracy as a primary virtue and value uh, in US foreign policy such that the fact that Taiwan is a democracy is a justification sufficient to secure US continued support for Taiwan. So I think there are many, many, many officials in our government, many members of Congress, and they have expressed themselves in various ways over the last couple of years. And toward this point, there, you know, there are no shortage of US officials who, who value democracy highly, but the leadership in the White House has showed to date no evidence of uh, regarding democracy as a value in and of itself for which the US would make real sacrifices. And so I think that that was an important part of the, the TRA's evolution as Taiwan became a democracy, the TRA could, could encompass Taiwan's democratization as a, as a reason for its own continued relevance. And then the other um, feature of the current US policy environment that I find very uh, worrisome from the point of view of the TRA is America first. Because if America first is the underlying logic of US foreign policy, then there's no particular reason for the US ever to sacrifice for another country. And the only way in which Taiwan could be useful to an America first America is as the unsinkable aircraft carrier, as a, a kind of weapon in a um, struggle against the PRC, and I don't think it's ever good for Taiwan when Taiwan is weaponized for US conflict, US-China conflict. So while I appreciate the subtlety and, the, and you know, I know it's, it's difficult to find the right balance, it worries me a lot when it seems as if the only value that is remaining for Taiwan among a certain wing of US policy communities is as something we could use to get at China. Because I think Taiwan should be, Taiwan has value in its own right. It's not a tool for the US to do, to use for any purpose. And so that's why the post, post Cold War era, at least in the last couple of years under this administration, feels like a less hospitable moment for the TRA than the Cold War and the post-Cold War did. Yeah, Russell. <clears throat> Thank you, Jack. And I just want to sort of respond uh, a bit to my co-panelists' comments, um, but also sort of reinforce what I said, or clarify what I said earlier. And I think the key point here, though, I do, I do want to make is that U.S.-Taiwan relations are stronger than it's ever been since 1979. I think we, that's, that's a fact. And I think this is a function of Taiwan's democratization. It's also a function of China's increasing belligerence. Uh, and this is also a function of the growing trust between Washington and Taipei. Uh, I do want to emphasize the point that I do think that there is wide latitude for policymakers within Taiwan and the United States to work within the existing framework. I am not suggesting in any way to, uh, to, to, to dismiss the framework. But I do think uh, in what I was making earlier the comment about being a having a proactive policy is perhaps better described as a more affirmative policy of soft balancing in the Taiwan Strait. And I think here, at the risk of having uh, Jerry uh, correct me, it's perhaps worth reminding ourselves that the only legal underpinning here of US policy towards Taiwan uh, is the Taiwan Relations Act. And, uh, and US policy towards Taiwan has, over the past 40 years, has operated on the premise that America's primary interest is in the process as opposed to the outcome of resolving differences between the two sides of the Taiwan Strait. Now, this was what I was describing earlier as sort of more of a reactive approach, uh, which allowed, basically ceded the initiative to the two sides to 
work out a solution. Um, I think Jack alluded to this earlier, but this was a policy that some senior policymakers here in the United States thought was going to create a fait accompli. Um, but it did provide a sort of a uh, flexibility to respond to the broader geopolitical challenges of the Cold War um, while trying to maintain stability and holding out uh, for some type of peaceful solution in the Taiwan Strait. But uh, as we've also all mentioned here, that despite expectation to the contrary, Taiwan thrived, Taiwan democratized, and is now a thriving and vibrant democracy. Um, and I think that that context requires a greater a, a rethinking, at the very least, in terms of how that factors into uh, the role of Taiwan in U.S. foreign policy. I, you know, um, am a little bit more optimistic, perhaps, than what I see as uh, the U.S. policy towards Taiwan and the role that uh, of how Taiwan fits into the uh, broader uh, free and open Indo-Pacific strategy of the of the United States. Um, but nonetheless, I am very concerned about what I see as this still uh, growing disp power disparity between, ta uh, between Taipei and Beijing, and to some degree, um, a tendency to uh, have an undue deference uh, towards Beijing's sensitivities, uh, which I think has over time gradually eroded uh, some of the original commitments made under the Taiwan Relations Act, as well as another key, uh, I think, important statement of policy, which is the six assurances. Um, and I do think that as this power disparity widens without some type of, uh, uh, you know, sort of more proactive, you know, uh, more affirmative policy of, uh, of shoring up the U.S. Taiwan relationship, um, if we keep defining the metric as being sort of uh, the process oriented, it is going to continuously going to erode and, and edge towards Beijing because Beijing is just going to continue. Uh, in my estimation, uh, this on this path of greater coercion, um, Jerry has, I think, you know, made a very good point about that. Yes, that that, that behavior can be modulated, and that behavior could, you know, change. Um, but that is with the precondition uh, that I think uh, is uh, limits uh, the sort of the uh, uh, that that puts the onus on Taipei and Washington to somehow, you know, sort of sacrifice our values and interests uh, for that of Beijing. And I think that that is a, uh, I think, a losing proposition if, again, if the only condition, if the only way that it can be peaceful is if we appease Beijing, then uh, I think that that's an unworkable solution and we need to be, uh, again, we need to be more uh, assertive in responding to uh, PRC's coercive uh, campaign, which I think is gradually changing the status quo. Yeah, June just wanted to get it on this for a bit, so let's uh... Yeah, uh, Jerry, I would not disagree that uh, China and Taiwan leadership are both capable of being pragmatic. But let's look what went on with my name, Joe. Uh, please, they are not negotiating as equals. Um, it was my name, Joe, who went to China. Uh, and I was in China, as you probably were at the time, and I noticed that as soon as my angel started to talk, the sound went off, and uh, also that he was wearing a small pin in his lapel, and all of a sudden this big blob of, of uh, I don't know, haze, Pixelation. yeah, yeah uh, occurred. And uh, to the extent my angel was, was being uh, pragmatic, uh, what he was doing is buying peace in the Taiwan Strait by sacrificing Taiwan's pieces of Taiwan sovereignty to economic agreements. And uh, at a certain point, that uh, he, he got he had a real someone put it to me a ten year uh, for what people in Taiwan were thinking, and you got the the, the sunflower movement. And as for uh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, so, uh, I mean, no, no negotiation is equals, and uh, there are some things in the Taiwan Relations Act that also bother me, and that is that the United States will supply Taiwan with such defensive weapons as are necessary to maintain peace in the Taiwan Strait. Could you ever think that teeny weeny Taiwan would have the capacity to defend itself militarily unless the United States was in that equation? 
not just by supplying defensive arms. So uh, I think that's something we need to work on. And as for those three communicators, I am happy to say that I think the 1982 one has become a dead letter. <laughs> I think we shouldn't exaggerate the extent to which Ma uh, damaged the security of Taiwan because in many ways- I said the sovereignty. I said giving away the pieces of the sovereignty. Well, I never know what pieces of sovereignty mean. We hear that word all Airline time. routes that suppo are supposedly uh, 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 cross straight but look a lot like domestic airline agreements. I could go on. Well, we can debate <laughs> that, but let's talk about the military situation you just mentioned. About. I worry about that. Uh, I think unless both the United States and Taiwan improve their military postures vis-a-vis -vis the defense of Taiwan, it may make it look too easy for Beijing through coercion and other methods uh, to achieve its goal. Uh, I worry about U.S. public opinion. Uh, it's the elite in Washington and people in this room know a lot about the situation, but most people United States don't know the difference between Thailand and Taiwan. And there's a story I always use of the journalist who asked a highly intelligent American woman, what do you think about Taiwan? And she said, oh, I love Thai food. <laughs> and that illustrates the problem. Now, we don't know how important public opinion would prove to be in a cross-grade crisis. We do know the American are tired of foreign involvements, and that's the terrible price we pay for our foolish George uh, W. Bush policies uh, in the Middle East, and we don't know how they'll be affected by a, des a desire on the part of the government to intervene for Taiwan. Of course, the public opinion in a crisis may not be important. It may be the elite in Washington will simply respond or not respond, and how they respond may depend on how well prepared we are, and we're not well enough prepared uh, to take on the risks of defending Taiwan, and the Taiwan military seems quite unimpressive at this point uh, in terms of equipment, in terms of morale, in terms of the uh, tacit belief that, well, we don't have to worry too much because the U.S. will protect but as any expert who studies the problem points out, there's a time lag. How long will it take the United States, especially given its current posture, to come to the defense of Taiwan? And could the Taiwan people hold off the opposition during that necessary period? Uh, and are people in Taiwan really determined to defend themselves? And of course, Beijing is subjecting them to endless blandishments to tell them how important it is to cooperate with the mainland. That's where the jobs are. That's where the economic future is. And the future does not lie in the terrible risks of trying to defend yourself militarily. So there are many questions here uh, that we have to uh, uh, go with. Taiwan are questions of budget. Is the government willing to allocate the budget required to improve its military posture? And do the people feel that the military attracts them and has their confidence? Because there have been some severe problems with injustice in the military and the mistreatment of Taiwan people. Uh, there are a lot of questions to be dealt with here, and I think it's time that in America and in Taiwan, begin to uh, uh, pull up their socks. Okay, I'm just uh, supplementing or echoing some of what my colleagues said here. If you look at the, the threats, uh, they do kind of come from all sides. And if you look at the, the mainland side, I worry about uh, either hubris, that is that China thinks it can put the screws to Taiwan uh, because of the sense of the growing imbalance that my colleagues have talked about here. Um, I also worry that China, that China will believe some of its own propaganda about what Taiwan is up to. You know, Tsai Ing-wen is, 
or sentient again, they like to say, a closet independence thing. And if you really believe the propaganda, there's very little room for the pragmatism uh, that is potentially there. Uh, and, and that creates uh, the you know, invitation to, uh, to a somewhat more, uh, even more assertive policy than we've seen. Um, I worry about the US side in much the same terms that Shelley and, and Jerry and others uh, do. Uh, we've shown doubts about our commitment to security interests, America first, and about our commitments to the values interests that, that Shelley uh, spoke about. Um, but I also worry about the US sliding into a Cold War mentality, which gives China every reason to think the clash is inevitable, so uh, don't steer clear of a clash on Taiwan. And I worry about China misunderestimating, to use Bushism, uh, where the US is on this. Uh, that, that, that it may be that China thinks we are more gone from our traditional position of strategic ambiguity, which always had the clarity of saying we basically stick by Taiwan, and if there's a crisis or a problem in the strait, we lean a bit against the side that's seen as being, uh, as being the, the responsible party. And on the Taiwan side, I worry about uh, steering clear of the dangers of complacency, the belief that the US is there more unconditionally than it is. And on the other hand, the sense of being cornered, that as China turns up the, the pressure as Taiwan becomes ever more economically dependent and militarily vulnerable, uh, that there will be a sense of being cornered, and cornered uh, entities of any sort, people, animals, and countries, uh, can, can behave in, in ways that, that are really quite dangerous and destabilizing. Well, we want to turn to our audience very soon, but I want to give our panelists one last question to weigh in on before you all get to have at us. And that is, we've talked about this some already, but um, what is it that you think we need to do now? What are the steps ahead to make it possible so that Jerry and everyone else is here 40 years from now, uh, and we talk about the Taiwan Relations Act, and we can talk about whether it is an enduring framework at 80, uh, what is it going to take to get us, well, even, let's say, more modestly to 45 uh, or, or, or 50? We've seen some efforts now. For the first time in a long time, Congress has actually passed legislation that addresses Taiwan status and Taiwan relations with the US. The Taiwan Travel Act provisions the National Defense Authorization Act, the uh, operatically named ARIA, the Asian Insurance uh, Act. Uh, so uh, what, what, sh what should we be doing um, to, to make it possible to have um, uh, again, a session five, ten years from now that, that we can update the banner for. Jerry? I learned one thing in coming here a little early tonight. I looked up at the sign and it reminded me this is called the Taipei Economic and Cultural Office or Organization. It should be called the Taiwan Organization, not Taipei. Most of little steps, some of which the administration in Washington has begun to take, as uh, Ambassador Xu noted uh, earlier, and there are many more. One that I have uh, urged for years with no progress is that the State Department uh, modify the current ban on the leaders of Taiwan coming here and exchanging ideas freely instead of just relying on their brief pass-throughs en route to somewhere else, which certainly inhibits the American people's opportunity to learn about Taiwan. We should be able to have President Xi come here, Tsai. President Tsai should be able to come here. Your Vice President, she needn't go to the White House but certainly she should be able to come to the major organizations like the Foreign Policy Research Institute, the Council on Foreign Relations. The American people need to know much more about Taiwan and not allowing us, it's a restraint on my freedom of speech, my freedom to learn by not permitting me to see these people in action. And although technology can overcome it, sometimes I've interviewed your Taiwan presidents, vice presidents via technology, Skype, etc. But that isn't as good as having them in person. And that's an important step. We shouldn't allow Beijing to take away our American freedom of speech and the right to learn more about Taiwan. There are a number of steps like that we could take. It was good, Andrew. We want a couple minutes on the subject. Yeah, I guess I would say uh, something that the U.S. ought to do is to listen to the leaders and the people in Taiwan and to 
root our own responses in a respectful conversation with them. So, um, for example, the recent invitation from Congress to President Tsai, while, you know, um, I would agree with Jerry that, that the, some of the restrictions that the U.S. puts on, on Taiwanese officials visiting the U.S. are, are draconian and unnecessary. Uh, but I also think that um, inviting Taiwan to President Tsai to address a joint session of Congress put her in an incredibly awkward and difficult position and forced her to find a way to politely decline this invitation in order to act in a manner that is consistent with the security of the nation for which she bears responsibility. And I think it's um, not uncommon for politicians and others in the US to think more about our own desires or, or the, uh, what we imagine might be possible, how we might be able to elevate Taiwan in a way that would be good for Taiwan without actually consulting, actually, with uh, Taiwanese leaders and Taiwanese uh, citizens to know whether or not our plans are well aligned with their own assessment of their own national interests. So again, you know, advocating for respecting Taiwan's ability to understand and act in accord with its own interests is something I think Americans need to remember to do, especially as we become more and more convinced of our own virtue in opposing China. And I entirely agree with uh, Professor Cohen's characterization of the Xi Jinping government. But again, Taiwan is not a tool of US foreign policy. Taiwan is not a weapon to use against China. Uh, and I think you can get really spun up in your own enthusiasm for your own virtue and forget that Taiwan is a nation of 23 million people who deserve to be treated as ends in themselves and not as means to the ends of other nations. So on that Kantian note, we'll move to Jerry. Uh, yeah, I just want to reinforce what Jerry said uh, and uh, also to point out that uh, Japan, more than two years ago, changed the name of its office to the Taiwan-Japan Exchange Association. And uh, I think we could do this very easily. We have an American Institute in Taiwan. Surely we could have a Taiwan Institute in America. And we could say, this is, thank you. Uh, this is just a rationalization it's a, a rectification of names, <laughs> as Confucius would say. And, uh, and furthermore, it doesn't represent a change in policy. Huh? Okay. And so that would be one suggestion. And uh, then I also think that the Congress has in recent years surrendered uh, the Taiwan Relations Act, where it says President and Congress shall jointly decide. Um, uh, uh, too often we have let the deep state decide and in the form mostly of the State Department and Congress really needs to take back that role. Uh, you, you have some very activist members of Congress who are interested in doing this, whom I think uh, do understand Shelley, what, what Shelley is saying. You don't want to get Taiwan out in the middle uh, 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 of this. And then uh, we need to continue to respond to Beijing's bellicose statements and their salami tactics with some salami tactics of our own. And uh, this, again, is not that hard to do. And uh, we have made a start with the sailing of ships through the Taiwan Strait. And another thing we could do is explore with Taiwan the feasibility of American naval ships calling at Taiwan ports. And uh, again, I mean, I don't, I can't tell you exactly the, the uh, 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 what, what uh, displacement uh, Zoying would take, because some of our American ships are pretty big. But we have a large number of sizes of American ships. We, we could find some of it. And, uh, and then, uh, please, please, end this 
further mention of the Clinton administration absurdity that a solution must have the consent of both the people of the PRC and Taiwan. That isn't the way things work. And the PRC, these pragmatic people in, in the PRC, were able to accept the idea that of a referendum, for example, in East Timor that did not have the assent of the people of Indonesia. And we need to work on things. I mean, lawyers like Jerry need, need to, to work on this. And so uh, the, the taken together, I think, all of these things should provide assurance that for, I mean, I'm only thinking 10 years in the future, Shot, instead of 40, but, but uh, that we may gather here together to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the TRA. My caveat would be we've got to go very easy on American warships calling it Taiwan ports because Beijing has made clear that could strike lightning. Oh, stop it. it. You know, if you're like, it's like you're, you're I, I, oh my I, God, we may have set Beijing. We can't I, I, I don't do know it. That. <laughs> Let's just turn into Jerry Springer show. Uh, <laughs> Russell, you want to weigh in with your suggestion? Yeah, sure. I'll just make a fun comment here. Um, yeah, I think uh, that was entertaining. Um, so the, I think the primary objectives of U.S. policy towards Taiwan uh, is to ensure that a resolution is not coercive, unilateral, or detrimental to U.S. interests. But I think that the situation now is arguably even more coercive with China acting more unilaterally, and this is becoming increasingly detrimental to U.S. interests. So I do think that it is time for a recalibrated Taiwan policy. But this Taiwan policy must not, must not only ensure a peaceful process, but it also needs to provide a vision that reflects the objective reality that two legitimate, mutually non-supported political entities currently coexist across the Taiwan Strait. I believe that this must be the starting point. I think that alternatives to gradual changes present equally destabilizing propositions, and there is certainly a great deal of uncertainty that comes with any change. But even thinking about change, or about change could lead to the fear of think thinking about change, could lead to a state of paralysis. And this, I think, would be equally disruptive in the Taiwan Strait. So I think. Just a plug for a, a program that uh, GTI uh, also put uh, a, a couple of weeks ago in Baton Washington, D.C. We co-hosted a conference with uh, the Project 2049 Institute, which is another think tank uh, uh, based in the area. And we came up with five um, you know, uh, different recommendations on how the U.S. Taiwan relationship can move forward. And the first is an agreement to, a, to move towards a more normal, stable, and constructive relationship the United States and Taiwan. And so this is to deepen and to broaden engagement with Taiwan uh, and looking in the longer term about the U.S.-Taiwan relationship. The second is to promote higher level exchanges. This is actually you know, doing so uh, to engage counterparts in Taiwan on a regular basis in accordance to the Taiwan Travel Act. The third, and I think this is quite a low hanging fruit, is a free trade agreement. And that the United States government uh, you know, could begin negotiating a free trade agreement with, with Taiwan. Uh, four is routinized arms sales. Uh, and this is, I think, we're seeing the administration move to a process now that is uh, less packaging of, of the uh, arms sales request and moves in dealing with Taiwan on a more normal basis. And fifth, and I think this is quite simple, is to enhance people-to-people -people exchanges between the people of Taiwan and the United States. And I think that if we were able to move all these, uh, these five elements, um, I think we will be putting U.S.-Taiwan relations on a firmer footing uh, and that the enduring qualities of the TRA will be continued uh, to endure uh, into the future. And now that we've given policymakers in all three capitals their marching orders, uh, let's throw it up to the audience for your questions. Is there a microphone circulating out there? To... Uh, you didn't mention uh, all panelists. A crucial point is coming and we're waiting for this point. This will be China People Republic mission to the dark side of the moon. If this will be successful, China will be second or first power because Soviet Union never landed in a human 
cosmonauts on moon. And I failed because China People Republic now is going like pendulum between convergence and back. Convergence and back. And of course, Taiwanese people, uh, millennials, and Generation Z is going to the left. Okay. Uh, like, we we have a long if, line of people with questions. So if you have no, a question, no, get this is my question is, if we'll be successful land on dark side of the moon, enthusiasts in China People Republic will be very big. And this will be very dangerous for us, for Taiwan, and for China People Republic too. Okay, let's, let's take a couple more questions. Our time is short here. Why don't we uh, do the two gentlemen here and these two right here? My question would be if China does attack Taiwan uh, with military force, how likely the United States would step in and uh, intervene? Okay, and then one more with the panel chances. Thank you. Very quickly, congratulations to the panelists for this great uh, presentation. From a geoeconomic and geopolitical perspective, in particular, I would like to know what are your comments in terms of uh, the One Bell, One Road initiative, since it's a kind of multilateral, long-term perspective initiative of uh, China, GRC, and versus the Taiwan Relation Act, that is more a bilateral agreement between the United States and Taiwan. So basically, uh, what would be your reactions in terms of putting in context a multilateral uh, initiative in a long-term perspective versus a bilateral, long years ago um, created, but perhaps not updated in terms of that uh, relationship? Thank you. Okay, so we have a, uh, we have a Chinese moonshot, a, uh, an American equivalent of response to the Belt and Road Initiative, and what happens if China attacks Taiwan? Who wants to take any of those? Kelly? I can take the first one and the last one just briefly, and this is really to something Jerry said earlier. Um, I think China's, the People's Republic of China is extraordinarily ambitious at this moment and is uh, extracting from what is still by global standards on a per capita basis, a relatively poor and developing economy, the resources to do very, very large, expensive and risky projects. The moonshot is probably a lot less risky than the Belt and Road Initiative because the moonshot, either you do it or you don't, you know? The, but the Belt and Road is, could be an unfolding disaster over decades if these investments are, are not ever able to return um, you know, value in the way that ultimately they will need to in order to pay off investors. I think there is a, a sense in which the Belt and Road completely, it, it is a test of the international financial system in that we are asking Country, we, we are, countries are, are entering into agreements with the PRC that they are very unlikely to be able to complete in terms of paying back their obligations. What we don't know is whether the funding sources, what leverage they will have in the event of default. You know, we, we sort of assume it'll be just like every other um, international indebtedness, sovereign indebtedness kind of uh, situation, but when we know that a lot of these investments were would not have been made by any other lender in the first place, will other entities react the same way to default? It's just terra incognita, this Belt and Road Initiative. And so what I, what I just want to say is that I think China's future is highly contingent on luck and the preservation of a sort of you know, economic environment for a few more years that is favorable, uh, domestic stability, there's all kinds of ways that this can go off the rails. What that means for Taiwan, I think is probably nothing good if China does go off the rails. Um, but I do agree with the sort of tone of both questions that uh, 
China's trajectory is not linear, and the risks that it's taking are actually uh, creating a lot of hazard in the not very distant future. I'd like to uh, underscore what's just been said by Shelley. Uh, four or five years ago, I began to say that uh, China may have peaked. The reason we've seen Xi Jinping's huge repression now is he knows far better than we the challenges that China faces domestically. The world has an exaggerated view based largely on military development of what China's future capacity is, and I think we should not underestimate its domestic problems. The economy is going down. There are going to be serious questions, not only in education, but in terms of equality, uh, demands of people. Labor situation is poor. The population uh, is going down and inadequate. There are many problems there. Uh, so uh, I think we should recognize the good that China has done, for example, in the AIIB, the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. I think that was a brilliant move. The U.S. should not have opposed it, but should have joined it. On the other hand, the BRI, the Belt Road Initiative, I share all of Shelley's doubts. We don't even know how disputes will be resolved. It's going to be highly contentious. And this isn't mostly Chinese investment, as she has pointed out. This is Chinese loans, and that is a big difference. And many of these countries are not fools, and every day we see news, it's true, Italy now is apparently going to associate with it. But if you look elsewhere in Asia, Africa, Latin America, there are growing doubts. Just one final point about the importance of the TRA. Ukraine and Crimea did not have a similar guarantee from the United States. And one of the things we have to worry about is would China try to do to Taiwan what Russia has done to Crimea? I think the TRA is about the best thing that stands between Taiwan and that kind of a fate. So just to address the, the sort of U.S. policy portion, so we'll get a couple more questions over here. Um, you know, the U.S. is turning away from multilateralism. Uh, it's been a slow erosion of support for a multilateral post-war structure, and that, I think, is unfortunate. Uh, we don't want to mimic the BRA, BRI for reasons just, just mentioned, but it would be nice to be a bit more engaged. Whether the U.S. would uh, defend Taiwan in the case of an attack, well, there's less confidence than there would have been when the military balance was much more clearly on the U.S.'s side in a possible U.S.-China confrontation. But we don't have to know that the U.S. would. We just have to make it, make sure that China isn't sure the U.S. won't. Uh, and, and I think all the signs of commitment to Taiwan, things about the, you know, the pivot's been somewhat hollow, the free and open Indo-Pacific may be somewhat hollow. But I think if we, if we restate the commitments we have made and why it's important not just to Taiwan, but to the U.S. position in the Indo-Pacific, which are the core strategic interests and to the values issues, and we just keep doing that, uh, then they got to worry, and that's probably enough. Let's take a couple questions over on this side. There was uh, the woman in the, in the, yes, there, you. Thank you so much um, for speaking today. Um, I have a question, so I think that we talked about mostly about um, physically attacking Taiwan, but I was thinking how 40 years ago, we didn't, Taiwan wasn't really a democracy, and we didn't have social media or um, technology risks, like, like ASINs being hacked, and we're not really sure uh, from the coverage, not really sure where it's being hacked from. Um, do you think that, is, is this topic being talked about, whether there's collaboration or that um, in DC they see that um, democratic peace or supporting democracy on the world via uh, idea of supporting free speech? Like, I mean, I'm thinking about the same issue we have here in the United States as well re-election, we have fake news, and we have social media, all these dangers that are not really physically um, missiles being um, launched or like in Crimea being um, being annexed by Russia, um, things like that. I was wondering if you have any insights on that. Okay, thanks. I think another question from the side here. Uh, yes, in the second row. Uh, so 
Jack mentioned uh, the Taiwan Travel Act and the National Defense Authorization Act. Um, so I think they signify uh, the new developments uh, in the U.S. policy. I wonder uh, to what extent do you hope these legislation would um, uh, change uh, the U uh, U.S.-Taiwan relations uh, in a more positive way? And uh, are these adjustments uh, that will gradually uh, move towards a more affirmative approach that Russia, uh, Russell talked about in his remarks. Thank you. Okay, I know we're up against our time already. We'll take uh, one last question. I guess we'll go in the same row here and then uh, give our panelists a chance to respond. I don't want to keep our audience too long or people have to get to planes and so on. We know that our president is known, Trump is known for making impulsive, like uh, a policy surprise by Twitter. So what if uh, he accidentally you know, pushed the envelope to a certain extent? that he support Taiwan as much as he support Israel. Should we, those who, uh, should we be careful what we wish for, for those who uh, wish that we have more recognition, but this is probably too good to be true. But what if, you know, it, it happened accidentally through Twitter? Okay, who wants that one? Uh, you want to start? Um, okay, I mean, I totally agree with what you said about pushing envelopes, and we, we have to be very careful. Um, uh, the, the, and we don't do anything uh, rash before we talk quietly with President Tsai about what she thinks is, is the proper thing. So, uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, you don't want to, you want to keep loving your friends, but you don't want to love them to death. And, uh, and uh, I think President Tsai has done an excellent job. She's very cautious by nature. I know I won't tell you who but one of her very high-ranking officials was tearing his hair shortly after she was inaugurated because he needed an answer right away. And she said, let me think about this overnight. And, uh, and so again, uh, this, is, this is something that needs careful calibration. Um, dark side of the moon. Uh, you know, I think if that happens, it should be <coughs> praised as the kind of achievement it genuinely is. But, to me, uh, China has had so many firsts over the last 10 years. They've got the biggest icebreaker, and they've got the largest uh, uh, indoor uh, saltwater swimming pool, and uh, uh, they've got the fanciest uh, uh, skyscrapers, the top of skyscrapers in the world, and so on and so forth. In fact, The Onion did a spoof on this a couple of years ago. Some of you may have seen where China has just been uh, crowned the leading polluter of the world, and uh, bands are marching, and majorettes are throwing drums, and so on. So I think it, it should be lauded as the great achievement it is, but I think, you know, the panache of China being first, or, or the biggest, or something, is definitely worn off. And uh, just to, the, the business about the, I, you know, sir, I don't see the Belt and Road as multilateral. I'm sorry, you mentioned that, you, you know, this is an example of multilateralism. It's actually a series of bilateral agreements. And if one of them fails, for example, the China-Pakistan China economic corridor fails, then you've got a hole in that chain that Beijing is trying to forge. And uh, the University of the Nazarbaya University, in Astana uh, had a symposium. Uh, you know about this? Yeah. And the papers are absolutely fascinating to read because uh, the planners in Beijing must be tearing their hair out over all the problems they are encountering. So, Shelley, I would agree. I don't think it's going to be a crashing failure, but I sure don't think it's going to be the success that it's been touted for. Okay, we've got to wrap this up. Russell, do you have anything on the sure. I, I think the, I want to address the question of fake news and disinformation because I think this is an issue right now that is front and center. And this is an issue that policymakers in the United States and Taiwan are paying very close attention to. And this is reflected in, uh, in bilateral mechanisms you know, uh, between the United States and Taiwan through the global cooperation and training frameworks to tackle issues of media literacy, 
And uh, from my understanding is that there's going, this is going, there's going to be another dialogue happening again this later this year. I think this reinforces again the importance of this issue that is really affecting uh, all democracies and where Taiwan really stands to provide a contribute to a, uh, a much better understanding, situational awareness, and hopefully also a collective uh, response, a democratic response, uh, to uh, the challenges that fake news and disinformation uh, from the PRC poses uh, to, uh, to, to not only Taiwan, but also uh, the rest of the, uh, the world. Um, and so I think that's, a, that's a, a, an important question. So uh, with regards to, I think, the BRI, I like to call it the One Belt, One Road Initiative because it still remains that in the, uh, the Chinese term, and that, ex that, and that is much more of an ex represents a more exclusive uh, type of uh, arrangement that you know, I think um, Jim, you rightfully uh, pointed out because it's not multilateral, it is a series of bilateral. And uh, it's really, it's, it's the PRC's, you know, really, um, initiative there. And uh, if I may be so bold as to, you know, respond to the question about the uh, military attack on Taiwan, and because I'm obviously speaking for myself only here, I believe that in a condition where there is an unprovoked military attack on Taiwan, I think the United States would intervene. So. Okay, well, we've got to wrap this up, uh, but let me just say one quick thing in closing since we didn't get to the Taiwan Travel Act, the legislative uh, uh, agenda, I would say, you know, these are welcome signs of, of uh, part of the U.S. government saying it's important to reaffirm these uh, commitments and ties to Taiwan. Uh, they don't actually require very much. They're statements of policy that urge the president maybe to do something, so like the, the way the TRA has evolved anyway, it doesn't actually require much of the executive branch. And I worry, the last point, I worry in two small ways about one is the TRA has had the kind of potency we've talked about because it has stood alone as the single legislative undertaking. Uh, I think these in some ways dilute the impact of the TRA, and I worry that opening the process, especially if it goes toward amending the TRA, that's probably not going to result in good things for Taiwan. I think it throws too many things open, and I think partly it's a statement of the lack of congressional confidence in the executive branch's commitment, and it's sort of a signal in that regard. That's a sign of weakness, not a sign of strength. Although, you know, given the world we're in, better to have them as pieces of legislation than not have them. I would like you all to join me in thanking our panelists for a terrific session here. Thank you all for coming. And thank you, Chairman.